can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. If you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too. If you can wait and not be tired by waiting, or being lied about, don't deal with Hello again, everyone. Welcome back. A quick thank you to uh, our wino, Rhino, for this fucking amazing tequila. Uh, number one, it's called. Good stuff. I'm not a big fan of tequila normally, but, uh, well, I suppose given that this is such high quality and given the context of what we're about to talk about, it's only appropriate. So, cheers to you. Mmm. Mmm. That's so smooth. Anyway, so hello and welcome back everyone. Now, you've all noticed this big new direction my channel's taking. Now, each month I'm kind of figuring I'm going to talk about a series of topics which are inter-correlated, related to each other. And just sort of my observations as it's always been. Just, um, with some new topics. Now, we're in a new month. I apologize for the lateness in getting this video out. But, well, it's a lot to think about. There was a lot to mull over. And, um, so we're going to start, well, I guess like we're always going to start now, with a little bit of a story. It's not so much a story, just a background explanation, a series of anecdotes to sort of bring you up to speed on where and how I got to my perspective, if just a bit. Now, I'm a man who, uh, well, it wouldn't be unfair to say I've been rather lucky with women. Um, at least for the majority of my adult life, never had too much problem in terms of talking with them, flirting with them. Sleeping with them, all kinds of things. A man who's uh, lucky with women, but at the same time, unfortunately, unlucky in love. And that is today's topic. Now, for my story. They oftentimes say that a man will fall three times. Now, it's a, sort of an old wives' tale thing, you know, it, it means nothing. But uh, it is interesting to think about. Now, in a way, I could consider myself one who's already had that happen three times. Now, the first time was pup love. High school. I was about 15. I've been following this girl around for years. Known her since elementary. Grew really close. Became best friends. Very intimate, actually. She was always going on telling stories about herself. Pity party kind of shit, you know? This and that's so bad. Home life's bad. Everything's bad. Bad. Now, turns out none of that was true. In a period of about 24 hours, I discovered that two years of stories and lies were nothing more than that. Just lies. And that was my first experience with genuine heartache. Following that, there was another beautiful redhead. Met her on campaign. Found her at what was probably one of the worst times in my life and found a sort of comfort and solace in her uh, embrace. The two of us had a thing that lasted for about four years, off and on. It was <laughs> altogether terrible, but uh, it was a worthwhile experience. And then more recently, as so many of you are probably aware, I had a woman uh, come to me and live with me for eight months. Gave me every indication to think it was real, but then in the end decided to leave and, uh, well, just straight up bail. Made eyes with a man-child. That was the end of that. Got me thinking a lot. As you can probably tell. Now, the nature of the social media commentary that I made last month, um, the, the considerations of the ways in which we relate to each other and how so much of that has been sort of twisted and changed by way of our modern society, where everything from social media and communication technology to these oftentimes insipid senses of identity uh, drive people to making decisions which might not, all, might not be altogether healthy. Now, why am I bringing all this up, and what's the point? Well, the concept of love itself, yeah, it's, a, it's a tricky one. Complex, complicated, the kind of thing that um, mankind has been pouring over endlessly throughout history. Now, love and heartbreak is itself sort of the, uh, well, uh, sort of the central motivator between... Uh, all kinds of mediums. I mean, in terms of our art, what outside of love and 
heartbreak, I suppose, um, could be said to have inspired as much music and art and poetry and plays and theater and films and television, all of it. I mean, it's one of the central facets to, to the human experience, really. And it takes so many different forms in so many different relations. Now, the reason I say that love is tricky and complex is because when it comes down to it, if you're going to take this cold, objectivist, rational sort of position, if you're going to consider the natural world and the nature of the universe itself into consideration and then compare that to what it is we understand about the concept and the practice and the experience of love and being in love and falling in love and falling out of love and all of that, whoops, if you're going to if you're going to take all that into consideration, then one thing you have to acknowledge is that in many cases, human love is an illusion. Now, I know, I've been I just expressed how much I experienced it, how real it was for me, how impactful it was, without even really getting into details. How could I possibly say that such a thing is an illusion that it's not real? Well, when you consider it from the evolutionary perspective the biological perspective, or if you just consider what it is that we do in terms of our courting and mating compared to the rest of the mammals in our world, well, suddenly you discover that there's a, a bit of self-delusion going on there, isn't there? Now, it's theorized far and wide throughout many circles of at least research and you know, academic science and bioevolutionary researchers and all kinds of other things that I don't have the time, money, or resources to really learn as much as I'd like about. But there is a circulating theory and kind of understanding that the hormonal, neurochemical um, realities to human love, they're really not a whole lot more than just a bioevolutionary trick to make sure that our species can survive. Now, the theory behind this goes as such. Once the initial hominids, the early humans, well, not even early humans, just the early primates, which would become what we are, when they began standing upright as a means by which to scan the plains, which I suppose used to be jungles at one time, perhaps, but when they would begin standing upright, well, naturally, the reproductive organs of the female, in particular, um, adjusted and moved on the actual anatomy. Rather than being on the rump, like most other primates who walk on all four, not primates, but even primates, but rather than being on the rump, like most mammals who walk on all fours at times, uh, it instead moved between the legs, narrowing the birth canal, therefore facilitating the need for a more vulnerable, delicate, and fragile infant human to be born. Now, as part of this, and as a father myself, and if you've ever seen your own child born, you could probably, you could probably understand a bit. There is a thrill and a terror and a rush which comes with it. The first time you see your own progeny, the, the, the spawn of your loins, the blood of your blood. Yeah? Now, the first time you see this as a father, it's said that oftentimes that we're flooded with, uh, I believe it's endorphins, uh, serotonin... And, uh, and the like, uh, pleasure chemicals. We're uh, filled with a sense of purpose and pleasure and uh, attachment and love and bonding to this infant. Likewise, however, it is also theorized that the sort of neurochemical processes of love and falling in love with another person are largely rooted in sort of mating rituals. This sort of thing, because once this infant is born all fragile with its soft, doughy skull and its inability to do literally anything for itself, the one thing that can be said to ensure its survival and by way of such the survival of the species is to have two caregivers, at least, watching over them and providing for them until a point in which they can actually in some way sustain and provide for themselves in a natural order. Now, most other mammals, and actually most other animals in general, they're born in one way or another with a sort of uh, built-in assurance that they'll at least have a shot. When it comes to birds, they're born in nests far removed from the world which might otherwise kill them. Uh, when it comes to things such as alligators, for instance, they're all pretty much born with everything they'll need to know. <laughs> Eat and drag and spin and all that. And yet, throughout the animal kingdom, we cannot really find too many examples of actual monogamy uh, between mates. 
Now, a lot of people like to point to penguins, much of the penguins. The, the parents will stay by the egg until it hatches, and then will foster the young until they're old enough to take care of themselves. This, is, well, this much is true, except one thing that we can also observe with that is that the uh, monogamy that penguins, for instance, experience, and this is one of those examples that those who believe that love is some kind of mystical, magical thing that exists exterior of ourselves, well, they'll point out penguins, and they'll say, well, they're monogamous. See, it's not unnatural. With the exception of the fact, though, that that monogamy only lasts for one mating season. And once again, within that, we even see an example of how the biologically programmed monogamy that, you know, two mammals or creatures might experience, it's rooted more in ensuring the survival of the young and the species than it is anything magical or mystical in terms of connections that we make with each other. But why is it that we are so convinced that this is a, a deep and meaningful experience that extends beyond our own basic senses and beyond the physical world, that it's something deep and meaningful shared between two people, which is so hard to express, yet we're all certain it exists? From my perspective, I would dare say that that's really just another example of our overcomplicated and complex psychologies um, coming up against the cold and unfortunate realities of the natural world. Now, we always, as human beings, almost consistently take what are oftentimes base impulses or instincts, primal urges of one kind or another, and we filter them through this perception, through this lens that we create in our minds or is created in our minds naturally through which we take these natural concepts, these instincts, these impulses, these things which drive us to interact with each other in different ways. And we try to make sense of them. We're pattern-seeking creatures. If there's one thing mankind, humanity in general, um, can't stand, it's an unanswered question. Why do I feel this way? Oh, well, clearly, it must be because of this, despite the fact that the thing in question may be completely artificial, something we've just come up with on our own in some sort of pre-programmed self-delusion to allow ourselves to make sense of something which we can't otherwise understand or make sense of. Now, if this is the case, and we're going to consider it in the context of love, human love, the kind which builds between two people, or, as some might try and say, builds between more than two, but this bond, this sense of belonging with and to another person, this notion that we have found somebody who we can share our lives and experiences with in a world which otherwise consistently suggests to us that we are completely alone. And that drives us absolutely mad and oftentimes terrifies us to uh, astonishing levels. But the way in which we process this, in which we make sense of it, we say that this connection that we have with this other person who we've met, who we spend all our time with, and we're so close and intimate with, it must be something real, right? But then we find that this very psychological mechanism, which allows us to try and make sense of this thing, ends up ultimately doing little more than further complicating things. Now, on a basic biological level, and this has been pointed out by... Um, MRAs such as Karen Strawn in the past, on a basic biological level between the male and the female, yeah? the female's genetic code is pretty much guaranteed to be continued. Whatever code they're carrying, whatever genes they're carrying, traits and the like, it's pretty much assured to be, uh, to be passed along. After all, the male's job is to inseminate, is to impregnate, is to help create more human beings. Now, the difference between them being is that the female has it pretty much guaranteed that she'll reproduce. She is, after all, the one who carries the child and gives birth to it. Now, in terms of the biological instincts which cause us to ultimately create children in the first place, well, <laughs> there is a reason that we men have a reputation of being dogs. Our instincts, our basic sexual impulses, dictate that we need to have sex whenever possible. Now, to us, we oftentimes, as men, sort of formulate this in our minds to a point in which we sort of convince ourselves that, uh, oh, well, it's about pleasure, well, it's about bonding, well, it's about finding a mate, or it's just about having fun. 
but truth be told, the impulse and the instinct to go out and br to go out and basically just well stick your dick in what could very well be crazy is nothing more than actually your biological impulses making sure that you take every step possible to ensure your genetic line survives. We see it in the animal kingdom when we consider what the uh, concept of perhaps the alphas and the betas within given social groupings such as the prides of lions or herds of elk, what they're really like. Now every male wants to make sure that his genetic information is passed along, so of course he's going to try and find a female mate at any cost, and any females, and as many females as possible, ensures that his genetic information will continue being passed along into the future, which is ultimately the central biological imperative of every organic organism or bit of life that lives on the planet. But again, we come back to the overcomplication of it through our psychology. Now, it's oftentimes theorized and, 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 promote, and, and postulated, at least, that in pre-agrarian societies, more tribal societies, where understandings of things were far simpler, and there wasn't necessarily the uh, sharp as a knife sort of understanding about what the genetic linkage is between parent and child and so forth, that the, these societies lived largely as what we might call these days polyamorous. They were, uh, in many respects, uh, open with each other. All members of the tribe had relations with member, other members. Now, the validity to this theory, I can't really say. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not an evolutionary biologist, I'm not an archaeologist, I'm not even a sociologist, but, or an anthropologist, I'm not that either. But all that being the case, it does actually cause one to pause if you think about these theories and consider how perhaps valid they might be. And then you come back around to the conclusion once again that well, perhaps my concepts of what love really means are a little off the mark. But back and forth between this, if there exists an objective, cold, rational, biological reason for us to fall in love with each other as we so often do, and it is nothing more than perhaps a biological trick of evolution, does that actually take away from the experience? Does the sense of that uh, meaningful and deep connection that you feel that you share with another person, is it somehow sullied by the fact that it might actually just be your neurochemicals tricking you into thinking a thing? Well, as we are also creatures who seek stability and security, as we are those who seek consistency in our lives and things that we can count on, trust, and rely upon, when you couple that with the very fact that even a subjective personal experience is as real as an objective truth, depending on the perspective discussing it, well then, I might say, there's not really any conflict at all. In fact, I might even go as far as saying that if our psychology itself and, and, and the developed psychology we get through our socialization dictates not only that we must find a mate and a partner who we are compatible with, one who we feel close to, and one who sort of triggers and inspires those biological impulses, those neurochemical tricks which start popping up in our brains and causing our entire physiology sometimes to change just in the excitement of being close to another person. Well, I would say that if we are in some ways tricking or fooling ourselves in that respect, that it's not so much necessarily the kind of delusion or self-delusion which one might need to strive to free themselves of in some way, as much as perhaps maybe it is just simply nothing more than us playing out the roles that we were assigned before we had even come to realize that we were a thing. It's a fascinating thing to consider the nature of human love. People oftentimes look at the twin emotions of, I suppose, love and hate, and they see them as polar opposites, they see them as, uh, as counterparts, on a scale in a sense. And they will oftentimes say that love can save the world and that hate is the most dangerous emotion. But for anyone who's ever been heartbroken, or anybody who's actually observed or had to experience the heartbreak of another actually being dragged into their lives in some way, perhaps the, uh, the new uh, suitor, lover, or uh, paramour that you've taken has a, perhaps an ex who's just not quite over it. Well, one thing that we can find is that uh, love itself can be and often is one of the more dangerous and destructive impulses and emotions a human can feel. There is one thing we can say for the emotion of hate, which I will be covering in the next video, but there's one thing we can say about that in respect to and in contrast to that of love. 
Hate has a shelf life. It's got a half-life, really. It won't last forever. It cannot perpetually motivate one. As much as we might think it can, that, that seething sense of hatred, if you've ever had it in yourself for another person, or for something exterior from yourself, or even for yourself, it can only last so long, and it can only drive you so far. But if we look throughout history, we see constant examples of just how far love will drive a person, to what depths that it will bring them, how far people are willing to go for what they love as opposed to what they hate. We talk of love oftentimes, so often, just in common conversation, but as well as through art and literature and the like, to the point where it's almost a trite topic at this point. It, it, it almost feels as though there's nothing left to be said about it, yet every time we look at it again, there always is something new to be explored. But in this, I think it's important that people consistently sort of check themselves, make sure that they're not falling too deep into the delusion which just feels good, and that's why they give in to it, and actually taking a, as, as, as intelligent and objective and honest a perspective on the matter as we can. Because a great deal of what drives human suffering is the absence of the understanding of the emotions of another. It's failing to realize the kinds of hurt that can be done by taking away that which someone loves. Or perhaps how far one who loses something that is important to them, which they hold close to their heart, how far they're willing to go afterwards if they're not taking the steps to check themselves and remember what it is that's driving them forward in the first place. Love is a dangerous thing. It is not the cure to human ills in the way that people often like to say. And though it can heal and improve and empower people, it can also destroy them or drive them to destroy others. Love is a dangerous, tricky thing, but it is something that ultimately we really can't get away from. If there's one thing that the last six years of my own life have taught me, it's that attempting to deny that part of oneself it can often be more destructive than letting it in and letting it fail. If nothing else, I suppose I'll just leave you with this. As you go through your lives, be you in deep and committed love affairs, or be you simply pining for someone, or simply if you're just waiting around or just going about your life, waiting or either actively or passively for what will be that inevitable fall that we all inevitably come to time and time again, be mindful. It's easy enough over time, after a series of experiences, to gain new and different perspectives, but it can be difficult at times to remember how careful one genuinely needs to be. Because beyond simply the kinds of hurt that we can affect upon each other, the kinds of actions that those who are experiencing said hurt can engage in if they are to perhaps be less in control of their more baser instincts, can be far more destructive than the most hateful and wretched actions taken from those lower base instincts alone. Love is not merely a feeling, but it is a fuel. And what it fuels depends on how we handle ourselves and how we handle our relations with others. So, I guess that's all for now. I'll see you again next time in the next video, where I'll actually be exploring the concept of hate. Yeah, that should be interesting. In the meantime, there will be actually a special uh, request video going up soon. It'll be the reading of an old speech, one I think you will all love and enjoy. Past all this, though, give a like, subscribe if you haven't already, leave a comment. Let me know what you think. I mean, what have your experiences been? What have your observations as a result of those experiences been? And what have you learned? Am I way off base, or am I right on the mark? Am I missing things, or have I put too much in? Links down below, also to the Patreon, the PayPal, YouTube Saints, other things that you might want to explore if you're so interested. I do, of course, always appreciate support for this channel. This is what I do for a living now, and I'm hoping to continue expanding and getting into even uh, more interesting and complex topics as we go along, especially through the new year. All that being the case, I will see you all, I hope, Sunday on YouTube Saints, 10.30 p.m. Eastern Time over at the channel, linked below. And until then, I have things to do. You can leave.
Anytime. Seriously. And anytime. Just. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. If you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too. If you can wait and not be tired by waiting, or being lied about, don't deal in lies, or being hated, don't give way to hating. If you can dream and not make dreams your master, if you can think and not make thoughts your aim, if you can meet with triumph and disaster, and treat those two imposters just the same, if you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken, twisted by knaves, to make a trap for fools, or watch the things you gave your life to broken and stoop, and build them up with worn out tools. If you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it on one turn of pitch and toss, and lose and start again in your beginnings, and never bring a word about your loss. If you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve your turn long after they're gone, and so hold on when there's nothing in you except the will which says to them, hold on. If you can walk with